The following story has been brought to you by storiestoinspire.org. A number of months ago, there was somebody who was making a chasana the next night. He wanted a bracha from the Vizhat Rebbe. He was not personally a vision or chasid, but he wanted a good gizunta bracha. His young wife passed away a bit before. So as an almond, he was marrying off a child by himself. So the Rebbe said to him, tomorrow night after the chasana, come back, I want to talk to you. But Rebbe, after the mitzvah it will be 3.30 in the morning, I want to speak to you tomorrow night after the chasana. The Gabba himself was wondering, what can't wait a day or two till after the wedding? 3.30, the chasana, the mitzvah tans ends, the yid comes back. Again, the one whose wife passed away, he married off a child by himself. And he sits down with the Rebbe, and he's, the Rebbe is talking to him for about an hour, questions like, what were the hot dishes that they served by the chasana's dish? The chuppah started on time? The new shoes that you got for the children, they fit well? Now there were a number of place cards that weren't taken. How many would you say weren't taken? How many no-shows? The main dish, I know there was chicken and meat, chicken or meat. What would you say, how many did each person take? This is going on for an hour. When the man finally left at about 4.30 in the morning, the person comes, the Gaba comes over to the vision, the Rebbe, and says, Rebbe, in the most respectful way, he asked, why 4 a.m.? That couldn't wait? And the Rebbe looked at the Gaba and said, tell me something. When a person makes a simcha, and then comes home at 1, 2, 3 in the morning, what's the first thing they do? They sit down with the spouse, they take a glass of hot tea, and they sit down with their spouse, and they start discussing every pitchivka, every cuticle, every nuance of the simcha. Who was this man going to talk to? Who was this man going home to discuss the intricacies of the fish and the meat and the place cards and the desserts and the hors d'oeuvres and the chassas dish and the shoes? For him it was chayshach. You gotta let somebody know that you care. People want to be spoken to. I have a brother-in-law. He was in Flatbush all the years, and now he's in Lakewood, Rabbi Yitzchok Mitnick. Amongst the many wonderful things he does, he's very, very good with children. I don't know the name. I know in the 1980s, it was popular to call the teens, teens at risk. I'm very uncomfortable with any... uh, coining of an expression. I think in the 1990s it was called Teens on the Fence. In the year 2000 it became Teens on the Fringe. And now it's called Teens Taking the Scenic Route. Whichever you want. I'm telling you, Amais, I can't say the name of the family. One of the most very, very prestigious family in America brought their son to my brother-in-law who does magic with these children. It was Rosh Chodesh Tamas. Rabbi Yitzchak, work your magic with our son. We'll give him the name Chaim. Now the date is important because the next day was Kriya Satayra. It was Beis Tammuz. At the time, my brother-in-law lived down the block from Landau's. Now I told you he moved to Lakewood. Landau's, the place that has Minyanim 21 hours a day, hundreds of Minyanim, thousands of people. There's Kriya Satayra. He figures, I'm going to buy Chaim and Aliyah. The Aliyahs go for... Three, four, five dollars. Let him know that I care. Let me remove Chayshech. It's not rocket science. My brother-in-law takes Chaim on this day of Kriya Satayr, Monday morning, Beis Tamas. They're ready to start the laning. And the Gabbai wants to know the bid for the Aliyah. So my brother-in-law says five dollars. Chaim realizes you're going to buy the Aliyah for me. He had in Davin, put on film in the longest time. A few minutes, late, moments later, somebody on the other side of Lando's bids $10. My brother wants it badly enough, 20 And I kid you not, then the following ensues. 30 40 50 60 It started to sound like it would have been bidding for Psicha Ne'ila Yem Kippur. 
These aliyahs go for a few bucks. Somebody came to my brother and said, Rabbi Yitzchak, give it up. You're bidding against somebody who's a Lubavitcher Chabad Chassid. Tonight's Gimel Tammuz. It's the yard side of the Rebbe. This guy's going to Eretz Yisrael. He wants to buy Shlishi and the merit he should have a safe trip in honor of the yard side of the Rebbe. Give it up. If you know my brother-in-law, physically he's a large, imposing fellow. That's all he needs to hear. He looks in his wallet and sees he has $120. He bangs on the bima. A hundred and twenty dollars shlishi. Chaim couldn't believe it. He was moved to tears. I know that you care. Meanwhile, the Lubavitcher, he's no fool. He went to the next minion and bought shlishi for five dollars. <laughs> My brother-in-law goes to pay. And the Gabbai said, Rabbi Mitnick was already taken care of. So what are you taking care of? I didn't pay you. He says, that person over there. He goes to a man, mid-50s. You paid for my aliyah? He says, the city that he's from. He says, yeah. I don't even know you. Why did you pay for my aliyah? He looked at my brother-in-law and said, I saw what you were doing for that boy. <coughs> Forty years ago, I was that boy. But I didn't have anybody to do for me what you did for that boy. I was that boy. But nobody removed my chayshach. You know what it's like to feel alone? So when I saw what you were doing for that boy, I wanted that mitzvah. By the way, just to tell you, tangentially, Chaim Bar Hashem, was shown, shown so much love. He, Baruch Hashem, turned his life around beautifully, and although I couldn't make it to his chasana, this is a number of years ago, <coughs> his siblings are my good friend. When he was in the middle of the first dance, I asked them to call me, and I was in my bedroom, I was mamish dancing, like Sudas or Biki Veger, at Chaim's chasana. People just want to know that you care. Nobody wants to feel alone. I told over a story that I had the privilege of hearing firsthand from the son of the woman that it happened to. He's a doctor in New Jersey, and that's where his mother lives. She had a heart condition, so she had to take medicine. She wanted to know if she could take it, Erev Pesach. So she called Rav Moshe Feinstein, the busiest person in the world. Erev Pesach. You know how pressure in Erev Pesach is? Dr. Pelkowitz says that the pressure for a Rav on Erev Pesach is more pressure than the near nuclear explosion in Three Mile Island near Philly in the 80s. And for Reb Moshe? Who had the patience of Reb Moshe? The woman called and Reb Moshe would explain to her patiently why she could take the medicine, why it wasn't a problem, and why everything was fine. The son told me my mother called Reb Moshe Reb Pesach for more than 20 years. Imagine getting the same phone call Erev Pesach for more than 20 years. You want to know by year 6 or 7 what I would say to that person? It's being recorded, so it's better not. Reb Moshe patiently tells the woman for 20 years, you could take the medicine, it's not a problem, it's not chametz, he gave her a bracha, he vinched her a good yar. The son tells me one year, my mother was getting elderly and a bit forgetful. And that year, Erev Pesach, my mother forgot to call Reb Maisha. She forgot to call Reb Maisha. About an hour and a half before Pesach begins on that Erev Pesach, as you may have already guessed, her phone rings. She picks up, and the voice on the other end says, Good Erev this is Moshe Feinstein calling. I didn't hear from you today. Are you okay? When I didn't hear from you as I have every year of Pesach, I was concerned. Are you all right? And once she told him she was okay, and he no longer worried, Reb Moshe, like all the previous years, reassured her, take the medicine, it's not a problem, 
and Vinch to run a good yard. It's worth closing your eyes for a second to let that story get you around the jugular. The busiest person on the busiest day has on his mind that there's a woman for whom it would be Chayshek, so he called her. I want to tell you something, and I'm sure many of us feel this way, but don't say it. If I would come home and my wife would say to me, Ephraim Elio, there's somebody who called and said, you don't have to call them back, you got out of a phone call. That's like a simcha. I don't have to, that's like a day you don't say tachnun. I got, a Monday, Thursday tachnun menach. I don't have to make a call? Reb Moshe's looking to make a call? The busiest person on the busiest day because he understood nobody wants to feel chayshech. People just want to know that you care. I'll tell you another Misa. I know I've said this before, but it's a very powerful Misa. There was a Yid in Borough Park who lost his family in the war. And he would walk the streets of Borough Park aimlessly, and the only thing that gave him chizuk to keep going was every day when this man was in Borough Park, he would stop, the man I'm about to mention, would stop the Tzabroch and Yid and give him chizuk. And the man who needed chizuk said, I had the strength to keep going because that person always let me know that he cared. So who was that person that had so much time to just stop a yid on a street? Who was that person? That person that had all the time in the world, who was it? Who had so much time? That person was Rebaran Cutler. Rebaran did not live in Lakewood. The yeshiva was in Lakewood, and for Shabbos, Rebaran went there, and the weekday, the, he, his apartment was in Borough Park. The man said, I was only able to keep going because Rebaran gave me chizuk. One day, Rebaran turns to the man and says, Reb Yid, you'll remarry, you'll have a daughter, and Be'ezer Hashem, I will be at her chasana, I'll dance at the chasana. The man said it was the furthest thing from my mind. Sure enough, he remarried. He had a daughter and she became the apple of his eye. When she was about ten, Rebaran was nifter. And the man was devastated, but Rebaran said he would dance at her chasana. About ten years later, when the girl was a kal and it was at her own chasana, in middle of the first dance, Reb Schneier Cutler, a Baron's only son, walks in, finds the Kala's father, and Mamish, Mamish, Lebedic, Lebedic is dancing with the Kala's father. When the first dance ended, the Kala's father thanked Reb Schneier so much for coming. But he said to Reb Schneier Cutler, I didn't bother you, I didn't want to be my tree of you. What, what, what's Reb Schneier Cutler doing here? And he said, Years ago, before my father was nifter, he called me into his room and he told me that there's a yid in Borough Park that has a daughter. And I said I would dance at her chasana. But it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Take down the name of the yid, the address of the yid, and follow his life with his daughter. And when you hear that she becomes a kala, Go to that chasana and dance in my place. So that's why I'm here. And I've had the privilege to say this over in front of so many of Rebaran's grandchildren. And they would all respond with the same comment. Do you know what Rebaran was doing before he was nifter? He had to tell Reb Schneier and others thousands and thousands and thousands of things to save Klal Yisrael. And what was on Rebaran's mind? There's a Yid in Borough Park. When you hear that the girl is a Kala, dance at the Chasna in my place. Because Rebaran, and like Reb Moshe and Erev Pesach, and the Maisa with the vision of Rebbe, the night of the Chasna, understands. Nobody wants to feel alone. People want to know that you care. Enjoyed this story? Come again. Bring a friend. Stories to inspire.org.